I spend lots of time together, uh, but Anne, always a delight to learn with you. And um, I am going to uh, need David Haas to make you the host so that uh, you can screen share. All right, so I can actually start without the screen sharing. Um, you just let me know when that happens. Actually, it's, it's live for you now. You should be able to do it. I'm good now? Okay. Um, so, hi, everybody. Um, I am both delighted and also um, terrified to be following uh, Rabbi Stone, who um, I also have a long history with. Rabbi Stone was my first rabbi and officiated at my wedding and, um, and is in a, a tough act to follow in every way possible. So I think what I want to start out by saying is that what I'm going to do for the next 50 minutes-ish could not be more different. And so lose all of your high expectations that you just had from this very high discourse that you had with Rabbi Stone. And let's just, let's start from a very different place. So, um, or at least pretend you're doing that, so I'll feel better about this. Um, so, I, as, as, uh, as Rabbi Abe said, I am a historian, not a rabbi. I, um, I did my doctorate at Penn in Jewish history, and now I work at Penn. And um, so I thought that um, normally I actually work with texts. I'm kind of an intellectual and cultural historian. Um, I work on the 16th and 17th century primarily of Jewish history in Europe. Um, but I thought that I would bring some images um, and some architecture and do things a little bit differently uh, tonight. And one of the reasons that I wanted to do that is that um, the deepest connection that I feel between what I'm working on right now and um, the state that we're all in um, has to do with synagogues. So, um, like a lot of people, I've been thinking a lot lately about synagogues, um, synagogues as spaces, and the role that those spaces play um, in our collective life and in our personal lives, um, right? I've been thinking about that, and, and, and on the flip side, homes. Right? There's a lot of um, struggling to deal with the loss of boundaries in our own homes as we're all working from home and now we're soon to be praying from home. We're right now doing a Jewish communal activity from home. And while it's very delightful and fun to you know, switch to gallery view and see everybody's houses when I peer into my screen and see Odelia there in the kitchen behind Rabbi Abe, the, the kids behind her, <laughs> see the kids popping in and see people's either messy or extremely neat houses behind them. Um, it's also a, a little bit of a struggle, right? The boundaries that we're used to having, um, both with our Jewish community and with our Jewishness and also with our work, um, are, are sort of breaking down in this moment. So um, there's the boundary issue and then there's just the fact that we're missing shul, right? We're missing that space. Um, and I say that as personally someone who's not an enormous shul goer, um, but I still miss it. You know, I find myself thinking about that experience of getting caught on the steps in that crowded area right by the front entrance when you can't get in or out because people are milling around. And that's just an experience that we're not having right now at all. And we're not going to have for a long time, but there's something about that experience that sort of defines us as a community while we're having it. So that's the way in which I've been thinking about synagogues and spaces and homes that I think I share with all of you. And then there's another way that I think I probably don't share with any of you, which is that I'm finishing a book right now, finishing writing a book right now, um, that deals with the Spanish and Portuguese community in Amsterdam in the 17th century in the time of Spinoza. So I've been finding the moments that I can find to finish this book manuscript. And one chapter deals particularly with their synagogue. And the topic of the book in general is the way that this community, the way that this, the members of this community understood what community is, um, what they understood community to be, 
how it was structured, how it worked, where authority lay in a community, what spaces were proper to a community and um, where they should be and how they should be laid out, all, all of these things. So I'm already thinking intellectually and professionally about synagogues and spaces um, in that regard. So everything comes together. Um, and then by the last thing I'll say by way of introduction to all of this is that um, I am not in general someone who likes to or feels very comfortable drawing like present day lessons from the history that I do. Um, so this is not going to be like prescriptive, like, hey, we should all go back to the way this was or look at this amazing model. What I think that history does for us, and I think this might go along a little bit with the, the tone of Shavuot learning really as a kind of exploration of Torah and all that that can mean. Um, what I think history can do for us, is best at doing for us, is just to um, offer us a window into the idea that it, things don't have to be this way. It wasn't always thus, right? It's, a, it's an opportunity to look outside of the assumptions that we hold, um, the things that we take for granted to imagine a different way for things to be. So, also, maybe talking about this is a chance to look at buildings and think about synagogues, which we're all kind of jonesing for a little bit right now. So it could be one or the other. Um, okay, so now I'm going to try to share my screen. Just a minute. Let's see if I can figure out how to do this. Let me know if you need help. I will. Can you see my screen right now? Yes. You're seeing the synagogue, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm seeing thumbs up, excellent. All right, so I wanna start with this building since we're talking about buildings. And um, as I begin, I would like to see if I can find out how many people who are with us today have been to see the Sparty, the Portuguese synagogue in Amsterdam. It's a major, tourist attraction today in the city of Amsterdam. I see two, only a couple of people. Okay, not a lot. Fantastic. Um, so this, what you're looking at right now is a picture of the entrance to the main sanctuary. Um, it's a really incredible um, building. It, as I just clicked through some images of it, I will say that for this, by the standards of the time, it was absolutely massive and lavish and grand. Okay, so um, it was, uh, I'll just go down to here. It was built just a couple of years after the Ashkenazi synagogue in the same city. So in the image that I'm showing right now, can you see my cursor? Yeah, okay, so where my cursor is now, this is the Sparty Synagogue of Amsterdam. This building here, just across the way, is the Ashkenazi Synagogue. The Ashkenazi Synagogue was started in 1670, completed in 1671, and it was already very innovative for its time. The main thing is that the, the Ashkenazi, when they built this, they hired a Dutch architect who was already well known for creating um, Calvinist, public Calvinist churches in the Netherlands. So they, they were able to model their synagogue after, after those churches. And the Spartan saw this project completed and did not like at all being overshadowed by their uh, sister community that they felt very superior to and decided to build something bigger, much bigger. So you can see how it really dwarfs it. Um, the footprint uh, is something like 85 by 125 feet. Um, the interior columns here, it looks, it's, it's almost hard to see from, from the, the picture. It looks like a smaller space than it is. These interior columns are 40 feet tall and the building is even taller than that. Um, it's got roomy uh, women's balconies that are accessed from a separate stair. 
and it's very well known for its furnishings for this um, for this uh, like Caribbean hardwood really intricate art and especially for these brass candelabras that are now only lit a few times a year. The synagogue is still in use by the Sephardi community of Amsterdam. It's a, it's a real sort of modern monument to the continuity of a community. It managed to survive World War II relatively intact. It didn't get looted. All of this stuff was there. Um, now it's part of a museum complex. And the size of the synagogue, um, so the synagogue itself, the sanctuary that we're looking at right now was the largest synagogue in Europe at the time, easily. Um, and it was famous for being that. And the whole thing was made even more enormous and more grand by the fact that the synagogue itself was surrounded by this compound. Um, it was just the center of a larger compound. Um, so here you can see, this is a view from the street. The, um, the outer ring of buildings are, um, it's a, I'll show you an aerial view so you can understand what you're looking at. So here is the sanctuary, and these are all buildings that sort of ring it, right? So the sanctuary is set inside um, a compound of like offices. There's the mikveh in there, there's the rabbi's offices, there's the lay leader's offices, there's the room that has the treasure box. There's the library, there's a winter chapel, right? So there's this sacred space surrounded by all of the lay and worldly spaces that are needed to support it. Um, one of the reasons that this um, synagogue is important is not just because it's amazing, because it really is, and if you ever go there, you should go and check it out, um, but because it's seen by historians as being the first of something that was to come. So this was the dawn of an age of a new kind of public synagogue. Um, in its own time in the 17th century, it was a part of uh, a, small, um, a small spate of large urban consolidated congregations, right? So as more Jews consolidated into cities and as cities, especially in the Atlantic world and in the Mediterranean, uh, began to be really important centers of economic and cultural activity even more than before. The city congregations themselves sort of concretized and communal organizations became stronger and synagogues were built to reflect. So this is uh, among the very first. And then the notion of such a grand and such a public and such a distinctive and such an attention getting um, kind of building for a synagogue began to take hold and really, it's the start of um, getting to, to where we are today. By the, by the 19th century and into the 20th century, this was standard. If you were going to build a synagogue, you would build it in a way that signaled Jewishness and signaled the Jewish presence in the street. Um, and that's one of the things that this is definitely doing. Um, I'll just show you. So the, the synagogue was reproduced. Um, it, innumerable times. It received a ton of attention from, um, from both Jews from all over the world who would visit Amsterdam and also from Christians. Um, they would visit, they, they were shocked and amazed and impressed and there were lots of engravings and paintings made. Um, both of the synagogue itself, which in this image is over here as you can see, but also of the synagogue and its compound and the way that it was set into the street. So that was one of the things that was really noticeable was the way that it stood out in the streetscape. The key point being here that it was conceived in a way as being very public, in a way that synagogues generally had not been. And I'll come back to that um, as a general rule in a minute to talk about what had been the case, but um, First, I just want to show this amazing image. So this is a view created in 1675, the year that the synagogue was completed. And it's a view of the interior of the synagogue, right? I, I, hopefully you can recognize it from the small image that I showed earlier. Um, but what 
but it's, it's presenting the synagogue in very particular ways. Um, and I wonder if there's anyone who wants to unmute and try to help read, read this image. How do you see the synagogue being presented? What is going on here? And um, what does the image tell you about what the synagogue means, both to the image's viewers and to the owners of the synagogue? Well, the, the thing that I saw right away, uh, this is Rabbi Abe, the thing that I saw right away is how full of people the image is. Um, and Dr. Ron Wolfson, who was one of my teachers uh, in rabbinical school, used to joke about looking at synagogue websites that had an edifice complex, that you see all of these pictures of the building, right? And, but here you've shown us these pictures of like a gorgeous building that today is a museum, but in this, I guess, kind of what we would call a contemporary representation, the artist has chosen to represent the building with lots of people occupying it and people who are obscuring some of the architectural details. Right, so you, you can't get a full picture of what every detail of the sanctuary looks like because there are people standing in the way. But to me, that kind of um, like lifts up and puts in, in the, the center of the picture that this is a building that lots of people come in and through and use. Great. Yes, absolutely. So the things that I pointed out in the other image, right, the, the, the columns are visible, but, and the candelabra are, are there, but um, they're actually barely visible. I mean, you can just make them out. They're definitely not emphasized in the way that they are in some of the other pictures. Um, and instead, it's full of people. The people are the thing. It's a public space. It's a gathering space, right? What else does anybody notice about it? Well, what we noticed is the fact that there's a lot of children, especially in the foreground. But then I noticed there's no women in the galleries. Yeah, there's no women in the galleries. And there are women down here. There are women in the main floor. So does anybody have any thoughts on how to explain that? This is a hard one, so. It's okay if nobody does. This is Josh. Um, two guesses I have. One is it's not during services. This is some sort of, I don't know, market day or social event or something like that. And another possibility is the artist just did not see fit to care about the women. I, I mean, I guess if there are women on the floor, then it's less likely to be that. But the focus yeah. is clearly on the floor and what's going on there, not the architecture or anything that's higher up. Right, right, exactly. So it's not during services. Um, and it's sometimes if you like find this image on the web, sometimes they'll, they'll describe it as an image of services in the synagogue uh, because <clears throat> there's a man standing on the bima. Um, but no, it's actually an image of the celebration that happened when the synagogue was dedicated, was inaugurated. So this is, um, you know, the, the, the Shabbat following Tisha B'Av in August of 1675. They started a week-long public grand um, affair, which featured um, processions of the Torah scroll, of course, but also musical performances. And the main thing that they had was that every night they had a different prominent community member give a, a kind of talk, like give a sermon. Um, and I think that one of the things going on here is that some of these people are not Jews also. So part of what you're seeing is that, that this is a, a kind of display, right? They're showing off the space, not only to the, to the Jews who would gather in it, um, but to people who wanted to come and see, and see the spectacle. Um, and I, I noticed right away this whole sort of like, supernal situation up at the top I can't really see because I'm looking on my phone but like I doubt that's an image of God but it could be Moshe I don't know if there's a Torah yeah. there all right so I'm zooming in sorry trying to on uh okay yeah it, it's more than like 3d art a ceiling art because <laughs> it's like it's there it's coming down from the heavens yeah, it's a kind of, of painting. It's a it's a it's a tableau, right? Uh, that's supposed to give 
you know how I said I don't really want to draw like a lesson for the present? Well, in the 17th century, people didn't feel that way. Um, so this is drawing the lesson, right? So mm -hmm. um, does anyone want to try to read the image now that we're zoomed in? Like who, who are the people? What is it doing? I think between like how there are like women on the general area and not in the balconies and this depiction of what could be God, I think that maybe <clears throat> the creator of this image isn't Jewish. Mm. I think you're right. This image, um, that's a really good point. This image was created by a Dutch artist. Um, and the meaning of this particular tableau is very much a Dutch message about what's, a Dutch Christian message about what's going on in this, in this scene. Um, and I'll talk about very, that it, what? These were very common types of images that one would see in looking at paintings that, you know, of Christ rising up or, and all of the mm. disciples and Mary and that kind of thing. It's a very, um, it, you just look at it and you think that you're looking at a, at a, church. at a ceiling. church uh, ceiling almost. Yeah. Okay. So the really interesting thing is one thing I want to say is although it was created by a Dutch artist, it was created for Jewish purposes. So it had multiple audiences. They actually made multiple versions in different languages, but this is one that was published in a book that was in Spanish and Portuguese for members of the community. So it was something that the, that like the lay leaders, all the donors who created this insane thing were, were on board with this being up there. Um, so the meaning of the, of this little inset, and then I need to, I need to start moving faster because I'm way too into this, but um, here we have Moses. Okay, so on the left, there's these two guys. There's Moses and uh, a contemporary Jew who is wearing a prayer shawl. Maybe he's praying. Maybe he's it's just showing that he's a Jew. But so the two men are Jews. Of the two ladies, um, this lovely one is representing the city of Amsterdam. And this one here with the kind of um, belt or pennant showing all the different coats of arms, this one is representing the Dutch Republic and all of the different uh, provinces in the Dutch Republic. So Amsterdam is pointing to the Jews who are here with them and showing the Republic something. She's showing the Jews to, to the Dutch Republic as a whole. And there's a little, um, a little, uh, uh, caption here, which uh, I can't quite make out the light. It's in Latin and it reads, the Republic thrives on freedom of conscience. So the message is to a Dutch viewer that, um, that it's good for the Dutch Republic as a whole for the Jews to be there, right? And, and there's actually a ton more that I could do a whole 45 minutes just on this, on this one particular image. I think there's a ton more to say about this. Um, but uh, the, the message, the, the specific message here is the city of Amsterdam is not only saying it's okay for Jews to do this, but actively saying that it's good politically for everybody. And it's good for, and, and maybe politically, maybe economically, probably a combination of, of the two. There's a lot of ideology going on in here. Um, but it's really showing off that it's got something great going. Um, there's one other thing I wanna say about this, um, which is just that even in this setting, where as Rabbi Abe pointed out, there's not a lot of attention to the actual edifice as an amazing piece of art, um, there are these insects at the top corners, which are emphasizing the architecture, like in a really, in a way that I've never really seen. Now, I'm not an architectural historian, but this, this of course, sort of blueprint, floor plan um, of the footprint of the building seems to me an, an unusual thing. They're really interested in the way that this sanctuary is set inside this compound. And they're showing it to you again here. Yeah. It, it, it strikes me that, that to your last point, and, and it's 
and it struck me in, in the last um, slide as well, that this is architecture as public art. That there, there's, and, and I wondered about the general trends within Amsterdam at this time around public sculpture. Um, so, okay, so I can't speak very well to public sculpture, but I can definitely say that architecture um, in Amsterdam at this time was, um, was very much a medium in which symbolism and messages like this would, would be typical. Um, and what, I, what I'm suggesting about the, the, way, the attention to the architecture here is not only that it's public art, but that it's public expression of what the community is and what it's supposed to be about. Right, and, and its prominence also um, asserts that they are at, on the one hand accepted and that they're on the other hand that they're contributing to the overall beauty of the city. Yeah, yeah. Now, that's a great segue because the fact is that their acceptance in this way, not only their acceptance um, at all, meaning that they're able to live in Amsterdam and practice Judaism, but their acceptance on these particular terms of having such a public and open building was massively strange and unprecedented and unexpected. So the narrative of how people were, how religious minorities were tolerated in Amsterdam should not have made this possible. Mm -hmm. so, um, professor, um, in Israel, I forget whether it's in Tel Aviv or in um, Jerusalem, I think it's in Tel Aviv, there is a museum of models of synagogues all over the world that um, fit with what you're uh, saying in that the Jewish communities always adopted and adapted to build their buildings so they fit with the communities in which they were. Yes, I am going to qualify that a little bit in a second. So thank you for that, and I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna just um, let's let's hold on to that wonderful comment for one minute. I want to highlight um, just a couple of things really quickly. So so first of all, the idea of toleration in Amsterdam. The caption that I just read to you refers to the freedom of conscience, right? So the rule of toleration of religious minorities, and this applied to Christian religious minorities too not only Jewish ones, so anything except the public, the state church, which was Dutch Calvinism. Um, the, the rule of freedom of conscience guaranteed that the state could not um, coerce you to believe in something or not to believe in something else, and couldn't coerce you even to practice a religion or to not practice any religion. So they wanted to avoid any kind of situation like the, an inquisition. But it specifically did not guarantee the right to publicly practice that. And there's kind of a technical distinction um, where uh, religious minorities were supposed to avoid having uh, formal associations. So they were allowed to um, pray as Catholics, for example, but they were supposed to pray as Catholics only within a kind of household unit. And here, this is why I'm thinking about, about homes. And I'm gonna sort of rush through this part because I wanna to get to the part where I talk about Jews praying in homes. Um, but the rule of toleration in Amsterdam was specifically that if you were not the Christian minority, you were supposed to limit yourself to private spaces. And it was a way of articulating the relationship between religion and the state or re between religion and politics or even a more fundamental relationship between religion and power um, where it was understood that people banding together into religious groups become politically uh, important and um, for a fledgling state that hadn't been around very long and that um, didn't have a super strong hold on power, it was, it was really important for them to, to try to tamp that down. So in, in Amsterdam, um, they there's, this, there's 
Today, also as a tourist attraction, there's something called this a hidden church or a clandestine church, and it's kind of this crazy place, and there's a lot of lore about it where it's a, a, an amazing, lavish, like everything's covered in red velvet and gold um, cathedral-like space that takes up two full stories of a building, but you couldn't see it from the street. The outside looks like a regular old house, and the way that the architecture works is you sort of go into the middle of the block in order to get to the large space in, in the middle of the house. And it's, it's a famous space, and the kind of popular understanding of it is that it's because Catholicism was outlawed, and they had to hide, and nobody knew it was there. And it's a little bit a part of an ongoing narrative that Amsterdam has about hiddenness and hiding. Um, in homes, um, and it's, I think it's no accident that Anne Frank and the Hidden Churches, Anne Frank has and the Hidden Church are two of the, the most important tourist destinations. Um, there's this opposition there between publicness and hiddenness and between religion and the, and the collectivity. Um, but the reality is actually that it wasn't so hidden. Actually, everybody knew it was there and there were many of them, most of them were smaller and, and, and less grand, but um, it, was a, it was more of like a don't ask, don't tell situation. Um, it was recognized that they were there. It was recognized that people beyond one household unit were probably participating in those prayers, but as long as nobody made a lot of trouble, they weren't gonna get called out on it for the, for the most part. So that's the setting. And that's actually what the Jewish community, both the Sephardi community and the Ashkenazi community both did at first in Amsterdam. So first they had their, their synagogues with inside homes. And then the first synagogue that the Sephardi community purpose built for itself, which was in 1638, actually architecturally was modeled on a home. So it looked like a mansion from the outside. On the inside, it looked like a synagogue. It had big wide open spaces. It had a bima in the center, et cetera. But the external view of it looked, actually it was modeled on one particular, you know, famous Dutchman's mansion. So again, there's this kind of tension back and forth. So what we see is that when, they're, when they built this synagogue and when they presented it in this particular way, it was a very specific move they were making, right? It's not just that they were going for grand, their publicness. They were asserting their place in the streetscape and their place in the Dutch city and in the Dutch state, um, which was very surprising. The other piece of why this is surprising and it didn't have to turn out that way, and the other thing that kind of adds a little bit of depth to all of this also is that, as many of you probably know, this community was made up of um, Spanish and Portuguese Jews who had lived or whose ancestors had lived as conversos. So they, they or their ancestors uh, had been forced to become Catholic in Spain and Portugal and then lived for generations outwardly or even sometimes fully as Catholics, um, hiding or maintaining some kind of Jewish identity, some connection to their heritage, sometimes um, domestic practices, like some version of kashrut or lighting candles. So one of the things that I would argue and that I, I do argue is that part of why it mattered so much to them to assert this kind of communal identity is because it's precisely what they understood themselves to be lacking in a situation of, of, of hidden Jewish identity. So they're not only coming into open Jewish practice, but they're coming into open Jewish public association. And, and it's a move away from a kind of home-based understanding of what Judaism can be to something that's much more public. And it's really imitating, as somebody said, it's really imitating how the Dutch understood public religion. They're copying that. They're making a Jewish public religion to go along, to go along with the Dutch one. Um, okay, let's see where we are. Um, what do I want to say? This situation okay so it was surprising for amsterdam it was surprising for this particular group of jews it was also surprising for synagogues right so one of the things that um, um i see i see an architectural historian in my <laughs> in my window here so now i feel like I'm, i need to get corrected um, if i say anything wrong please feel free to correct but one of the things that people say about 
synagogues before this time um, is that in general, they were not architecturally distinct. There was no particular style that denoted a synagogue style. And they tended not, so they were, they were built in um, what's often called vernacular style, which as far as I understand really just kind of means that um, was not trying to look like anything in particular. It just looked like a regular old building. Um, and they very often, you know, maybe they had a sign outside, but they weren't, it's not that they were hiding that it was a synagogue, but it was definitely not architecturally marked uh, as being a synagogue. And so I just brought a few um, examples of this to show the contrast. So this is one from Portugal. Um, I think it's from a place called Castelo de Vide. Um, it's by the sea. It's not a very interesting picture, but you can see how it's a small, low building, like maybe the Gothic arch-shaped, um, you know, doorways are kind of indicating something, but not really. Um, these are two synagogues that are adjacent to each other in the town of Furt in Germany. Um, again, they're, they're, you know, they're not massive, they're not tiny, they're relatively architecturally humble. They could be anything. Um, they're not marking themselves necessarily as synagogues at all. Um, then there are these two, which are synagogues that are inside. Oh, th this, by the way, these were built in, um, in the 17th century, just a few decades before, before the one in Amsterdam. These two here are in the um, Jewish ghetto in Venice. So even in a place that was marked as Jewish, very much, right? Um, and in a place where all of the buildings surrounding them would have been occupied by Jews, even here, this, uh, I think this one is the Levantine, no, I've forgotten and I didn't make notes, but I think this is the Levantine synagogue and this is the Italian synagogue. So they're synagogues of those ethnic groups within the ghetto of Venice. Um, and they also are relatively unmarked, right? The idea is that the architecture is just, it's, it's just a building. It's just a building that they needed to use for stuff. Um, and the Jewish identity and the nature as a synagogue is not, is not really shown. Um, sometimes, let me back up. Um, you know what, I'm gonna actually not back up, I'm gonna skip ahead. This, this image is of a space, um, and I think Lishai might recognize this if he was there for one of the seminars at the Cat Center. Um, this is a space that's within uh, um, a 17th century building in Venice. It's, I think, not a building that's in the ghetto, but it's an example of a space within a house that is a kind of semi-public space. So it's called a portigo, and it's, it's maybe, it was used maybe as a reception hall, as a place to bring in guests. Um, and a space like this could be used in a Jewish home for group prayer. So it's just one step down from something like this. So maybe, you know, this is really clearly a standalone purpose-built synagogue. This is probably a purpose-built synagogue, but it might not. Maybe it was repurposed from some other kind of building. This, now we're moving into creating communal prayer spaces inside people's homes. Um, it wouldn't have been a space that was dedicated to that all the time. Um, it was probably just used when it was time to bring a minion in. Um, uh, uh, the historian of, of 17th century Venetian Jewish culture that taught me about this described these rooms as being a place where at night, maybe the servants would bring their mattresses into this room because they didn't have a designated sleeping place. So it was a kind of all-purpose room that could be used for different stuff and it was sort of liminal, liminal with respect to the, the real um, sort of domicile of the house. Okay, so already we've got a contrast from Amsterdam in 1675 to, to these kinds of spaces. And I think we can probably come up with a lot of reasons why Jewish synagogues might not be so architecturally marked um, there, or why you might have a very humble synagogue or why you might have a synagogue inside a house, right? 
There might be fear of persecution. You might want to keep a low profile. There might also be laws um, or specific rules governing the right of residence of Jews in a particular place um, that indicated whether or not they could have such a space and also what it could look like um, and you know how tall it could be and how fancy it could be. In, it varied from place to place, right? So the conditions were, um, were really specific to local areas. Now there's another phenomenon, which is that many, many Jews didn't even have a synagogue at all. Um, sometimes it was because, again, they weren't allowed to because their right of residence didn't let them. Sometimes it was because they couldn't afford it. Um, obviously, gathering the money to make a, a special space that's owned by a group of people or by a community and to be dedicated to nothing but that requires resources, as we all know, as part of a, as part of a community. Sometimes it was just because their numbers, their local numbers, didn't really justify it. Um, in many cases, in many places across Europe, Jews lived in very, very small groups. So you think, I, I think there's a popular conception of Jews living in shtetls, surrounded by many, many other Jews, and formal communities being entities that were almost universal, that, that all Jews were um, subject to a local community and a local rabbi. But as, as a matter of fact, in the early modern period, especially between the 14th and the 17th centuries, there were many, many Jews who lived almost alone in a small town or in a rural area. Um, in Italy, in, uh, in the towns around Alsace, there's, um, there's a statistic that I have uh, from a friend of mine who works on this. In Alsace, um, in the 16th century, the largest village had only 11 Jewish residents. Um, most towns had only one or two Jewish families. So in all of those places, there was no local synagogue. There was no rabbi. There was no official communal spaces. Um, and so the question that I want to get to here is, what did people do? Um, so did they feel, if we come from a perspective of a world that has now come to accept a synagogue like the one in Amsterdam as being normal, was the experience of living in a small town with no synagogue a feeling of being bereft of community or bereft of real Jewishness? Or is there, or, or not? And what was the value of a synagogue and, and what role did it play? And so I actually wanna just rhetorically sort of go all the way in the other direction and say, um, why even have a synagogue? And I'm actually, it's rhetorical, but I mean, let's talk it out. Why, why, why would you even want to have one? What does it matter to your life or to their life to have an actual dedicated space for a synagogue? What does it do for you? Anybody? Well, I think it kind of sets apart like this whole idea of Hamavdil bin Kodesh Lechol, like the separate the separation of holy and not. That's a really that's a really um, insightful and interesting comment. I think that's what we feel it does today. I'm not sure that that's what they thought it do, did then. I'm not sure of that. And yeah, when you were um, this is Rabbi Abe when you were talking about. Uh, the the early modern, you know, these kind of Jews living like the only Jew in their village, um, you know, it reminded me growing up in Atlanta of people who were in their 80s when I was a kid, who so who had kind of come of, come of age in the early 20th century, um, where pretty much every town throughout the southern states had a Jewish family, and the big towns had two, um, and and there's something about um, you know, I, I think, I think for my, my childhood memories of their stories reminded me of some of what you were saying about this, the synagogue in Amsterdam, that to, to build a synagogue 
is a declaration of presence to the body politic around you. Um, and, you know, and of course there were not laws in the South about that kind of a thing, right? You know, we don't have those kinds of laws in America. Um, and so when, when the Jewish, when a Jewish community in Georgia or Alabama or South Carolina built a synagogue, it was a statement that said, you know, we're on par with the, the Baptists and the Methodists and the Presbyterians. We have a, a building, we have a, a, you see us from the street, right? You know, when you drive by and um, the grandness of the structure. I mean, my parents' um, synagogue, which was, um, you know, kind of the, one of the old establishment synagogues in Atlanta and the building that they built in 1955 that you can see from a block away. Um, you know, there's a, there's a, so I, th I think, you know, like, what does it mean? I, I don't know if that's exactly what it means to us to have a synagogue, but I think if we're talking about a, a Jewish community that's transitioning from having informal worship spaces to having a public building where you could have a lecture with hundreds of people present and have the kind of speakers, um, you know, remember my, growing up, there would be lectures that would draw non-Jews to come and hear these, you know, famous statesmen and theologians and, you know, and all kinds of like pe big ticket names. Um, I, I think for a community that's transitioning into having that kind of a space, there is a, it's a, it's a flag that you plant in the ground that marks your presence as a part of a larger community. Absolutely. So absolutely. And what I would say is that what the architecture of synagogues before the 17th century and, and later tells us, um, and, and also what other sources tell us, which I'll, I'll talk about in a second, is that um, Jews didn't expect that. And it may not even have been something that they were looking for, right? They knew that they were not staking a place in the body politic where they were, right? So, I don't want to be read as saying that Jews didn't care about having synagogues. I think that there are practical reasons why you might want a communal prayer space. So for example, having, um, using private homes as a space for communal prayer can be really problematic, right? You can imagine situations where things are gonna get dicey. So maybe you have, um, Maybe you don't have enough families locally to have a, a full synagogue or you can't afford it or you're not allowed, but maybe you have a minion. But the people who regularly host it um, get divorced or maybe they go abroad and don't come back or maybe they get um, in trouble and they pawn off the Taurus scroll that they didn't own, right? And there are cases of all kinds of things like this happening because it was relatively common occurrence for quasi-public, quasi-official communal spaces to be inside people's houses. So that's one thing. Another reason you might want a space would be just for, for space, right? If you've started to have enough people, you would wanna have a place that they could all comfortably be. Um, you know, this, this very grand Venetian mansion portico space was not typical of, you know, your average small, small house that Jews would be living in and sharing. So there's crowding. There's also just the sheer fact of, of, you know, the practical issues of if you have shared objects or ritual objects, especially a Torah scroll that you wanna keep safe and accessible, um, it's much more convenient to have a space where those things live, so to speak. Um, but what I wanna uh, suggest, and I'm, I'm, now I'm gonna really rush through because I know only, only have about two minutes left, is that in the, um, in the spectrum of Jewish activities, and even of activities that were marked by Jews as being Jewish, a synagogue was only one of many, right? And we can maybe imagine a, a continuum from you know, a super public synagogue like the one we've been describing to, to a single person praying with a prayer shawl over his head in his house because that's all there is, right? And a synagogue, even a synagogue like this one, is just a point on that spectrum. And the reason I want to put that image in your mind, because it's a way of kind of decentering the synagogue from the idea of what Jewish life is. It's one piece, and it may be even at the end of the piece. And what we see among 
medieval and early modern Jews who depicted themselves doing Jewish stuff is that most of those depictions are not of synagogues. Actually, most of the images of synagogues that we have are created by Christians who are interested in looking at them as kind of curiosities or maybe because they weren't comfortable. Jews most often depicted themselves doing things in the house, in the home, uh, in their places of work, which could often be the same as their places that they slept and lived, and also in the out of doors. And so typical sources for things like that are like illuminated manuscripts, Haggadot, that sort of thing. I've brought images from one set of, of image of sources like this, which is, um, this is a book called Sefer Min Hagim. It's a book of, of Minhag. It's, there were many such books. This is a, an edition that was created uh, around the year 1600 um, in Venice. And there are 26 woodcuts of Jewish life and Jewish activities in this book, in this edition of this book. And by my count, all but two or three of them are not anything to do with synagogues. So um, when you think about things that we do that are Jewish, um, here's obviously, well, maybe it's not obvious. What is this one? Lighting Shabbat with the Shabbos lamp. Yeah, this is lighting Shabbat candles. This one, this one's gonna be obvious. Blowing the shofar. This is how. This is Havdalah, and this one is in a, this one is in a house. There is, um, did I bring it? Well, hold on. Okay, so this one, this is a circumcision. Um, and you can actually see, uh, I think that this one is taking place on a kind of porch. So it's in a sort of semi-public area of a Phoenician Jewish house. And you can see a servant here carrying a tray. Um, this one is from a different edition. Um, I can't remember actually what this one was about. I think it was about kashrut, but I'm not sure. But here's a man and a woman in the kitchen together doing food preparation. Pesach, Pesach preparation with so the... This one isn't is a, There's a different one, which I, uh, if we find it, then I brought it, that is about Pesach preparation. That's like the classic one um, that people show uh, because I think because modern people think of, when you think of domestic Jewish ritual, you think of like preparing for Passover, right? Um, the Vilat Kelim is part of Oh, well, that's what this probably is, yeah. Okay, so these are all in the house. These are things that are marked, not just as things Jews do, but things, Jewish things that Jews do, right? Um, because they're in this book. This next set, these are outside. Right, so, so um, now, I'm gonna, now I'm gonna really, really hurry. This one is a wedding, right? It's a chupa and it's outside. This is Purim, this is Purim, this is a Purim carnival, they're all dressed up. And in the case of weddings and Purim and funerals and actually other occasions too, Jewishness was not limited either to the synagogue or to the home, but take place, took place out in the street, right? Um, so there was even a kind of like visible public street centered encountering others way of being Jewish that was also nothing to do with synagogues or synagogue architecture. Um, and then, oh, I did bring the blowing the shofar one. So this one is, um, I believe it's checking to see, uh, it's a calendrical issue. And this one is blowing the shofar. And this one, there's only two woodcuts that have this particular kind of masonry space with this kind of windows in this book. And, and I think the, that this one and the other one, which is um, somebody uh, giving a sermon, um, and I think it's for Yom Kippur, are in the synagogue. So of the whole spectrum of activities that are represented here, only some only a, a small minority are in the synagogue. And there's all of this Jewish meaning that was had in domestic spaces and other kinds of spaces. And the, the, to, so now to kind of just wrap it up, the point of all of this, I think it would be easy to read it, to read me and hear me and to, as saying, oh, but look, we can't have our synagogue, but we can still light candles, 
right? <laughs> we can still do domestic Judaism. And that would be really unsatisfying because that's not the only kind of Judaism that we feel that we ought to be doing right now. Um, and we, I think, feel because of the way society has rearranged itself since the 17th century, that the domestic sphere is one that is walled off from a more public sphere and a collective sphere, sphere that includes public religious activity. So the way that the Amsterdam Sephardi were presenting themselves became the norm. And as Jews became enlightened and emancipated and really took up their place in a Western, in the public sphere of, of Western societies, we all came to sort of adopt that as the center of what visible Jewish and meaningful religious Jewish life is. And that decentered all of these other places. In the Middle Ages, a home was not a private place in that way, was not walled off. In the Middle Ages, a home was also a place of work and it was also um, a religious and a sacred space. And the ideal of a home in the Middle Ages was very much one in which all of those things would overlap, where the orders, the higher orders, would infuse all of the activities that happened in the home. So the home wasn't, now we think a house is the place where you're supposed to be able to sort of take off your street clothes, let down your hair, yell at your kids and no one will see you, um, you know, uh, uh, not have your, not have to maintain a professional demeanor, um, not necessarily encounter the people with whom we see ourselves as being in a community or in a collective, right? The home is the place that you retreat from the public. But before that moment in Amsterdam that I'm describing, in the Middle Ages, homes were not demarcated in that way. So the thing that we think of as normal is the result of a kind of rearrangement of our sense of boundaries. And so that's, I think, what, in the end, that's what I want to draw. Not, hey, we're all at home. We can find a lot of meaning by returning to um, judging the calendar by the stars or refocusing on lighting candles and knowing that we're part of a community when we do that. But rather that we're in a moment too where our boundaries are getting messed with, right? Our boundaries are broken down um, and it feels very bad. <laughs> in a lot of cases, it can feel really, really hard. And so, the, the, um, but I think that it can also if we recognize it as a moment potentially of transition or a moment where a decent, uh, uh, where a recentering might be getting corrected a little bit, then there's also things that we really lost, right? With the move to the public sphere, we also gained a lot of um, uh, unhealthy gender dynamics and certain relationships with, with majority culture. And, and so just rethinking where the center can lie, I think can be a nice way of, of, uh, of experiencing what's hard right now. Very nice. Thank you, Anne. Sorry I went over. I'm sure everybody's going to need a few more minutes. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Yeah, sure. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Anne. This was, this was a treat.